Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, The New Economy. Consider this, a prosperous America, consumer confidence soaring, the stock market setting one new record after another, and the entire economy seeming to be driven by one new technology, the automobile. That's right, I'm talking about the 1920s when if you were a baron of Wall Street, there was a good chance you'd be driven around in a Lincoln Town Car like this one. Or if you were a more ordinary American, that you drive yourself around in a Model T like this. Many of the nation's leading economists thought the boom would go on indefinitely, failing to predict the crash of 1929, which of course led to the Great Depression. Now to today. Once again, the nation is prosperous, consumer confidence is soaring, the stock market is setting one new record after another, and the entire economy seems driven by one new technology, the dot, as in dot com, as in the internet. The question, of course, is how many parallels there are between today and the Roaring Twenties. Will our boom end as badly as that boom? Or are we in a genuinely new economy with changed economic rules? With us to discuss the new economy, one of the most important economists of the 20th century, Nobel laureate Milton Friedman. Is the economic future that we see taking shape around us the new information economy, so discontinuous with the past that it does indeed represent a new economy? I think not. If you go back to the 1920s, when you had essentially the same phenomena, what are the things that people say about the uh, uh, new economy now? It's a big technological development. Right. In the 1920s, that big technological development was in automobiles and electricity. In the middle of the 20s, there were uh, dozens of IPOs of automobile companies almost every year coming out. There were hundreds of automobile companies started, of which only a small number, of course, survived. The second thing that people say is, well, now we have a good monetary policy. We have, don't have to worry about inflation. The 1920s, you had exactly the same argument because the Federal Reserve, which had been established in 14, had started to learn how to run things, and from 1923 to 1928, it did an extremely good job, and prices were very stable. From and 1923 to 28, so there were five golden years. Right, prices were very stable. Uh, you, you, people talk about the change in the industrial composition, all of the mergers and so on. There was a big merger movement in the 1920s. Indeed, uh, Irving Fisher, who was the greatest economist of the time, gave a talk the night before Bl uh, Bloody Thursday, or whatever the day was in 29, in which he talked about all of these elements, every single element in there you can find in today's, in which he concluded in talking about how the stock market was in for a long, good run. He lost his shirt on it, but he was a great economist, and in a way, I don't think he was wrong, because you would not have had the, the terrible debacle if the Federal Reserve hadn't behaved very badly. And it never occurred to him that the Federal Reserve would behave that badly. Well, let, we'd better go into that for a moment. So the Great Depression was the fault of the Fed. That's right. Now, the stock market, I'm not saying that the stock market collapse was the fault of the Fed. Right. Not that, it it was a genuine have, bubble. The Fed, Fed may have contributed to it, but it was primarily a genuine bubble. All right. And it was a bubble that was, st it was stimulated. The boom, the bull market of the 20s was a, stimulated by exactly the same kind of forces that have been stimulating our present bull market. So there were like real changes development, real changes in the economy absolutely. that were indeed impressive. That's they were right. objectively taking place. That wasn't nonsense. But the bubble, now, you'd better actually define what you mean by a bubble. I don't know that I want to talk about a bubble. I want to talk about a bull market that gets very high and then is reversed and comes down again. All right. We've so, had three comparable bull markets in the, since the 20s. We've had the 20s in the United States, the 80s in Japan, 
and the 90s in the United States. And if you plot them one on top of another, they almost coincide. They have exactly the same pattern. So if this is new, so we, the 80s was new. If that was new, the 20s was new. So we're inching our way toward the edge of the precipice. No. That's a different question. All right. What happens after, there's no doubt, such a bull market tends to overshoot. By how much and when, those are much those more are difficult questions. questions. Right. And yep. especially by how much, mm -hmm. because that partly depends on what happens after the bull market breaks. In the United States, in the three years after the bull market broke. In 29. 29. From 29 to 32 or 33, the Federal Reserve permitted or forced the stock of money to go down by a third. For every $100 in existence in money, I'm now talking about bank deposits and currency in your pocket. For every $100 in existence in 1929, there were only $67 in 1933. And as a result, the, when the, the, that collapsed, I think it was a decline of 80%. The Great Depression was a long time ago. Haven't we learned a thing or two about managing the economy since? Between 1890 and 1945, the United States experienced seven contractions, three of 5%, two of 10%, and one of almost 15%. Yet since 1945, we've experienced just one contraction of a mere 3%. And today, in the so-called new economy, we find ourselves in the midst of an 18-year expansion that has been marred by only one mild recession. Mm -hmm. So the business cycle is becoming less important? No. No. I've always questioned whether there is such a thing really as a business cycle. What you have is an economy which is subject to shocks from time to time. Right. And a shock comes along which knocks the economy down and then it recovers. But the idea that those are at regular intervals of a regular size, I think that is not supported by, Could we, the, econ by the economy. I have no doubt whatsoever mm -hmm. that to a large extent past recessions were produced by mistaken monetary management, that they were not natural in the economy, they did not have to occur. But you had a situation in which the monetary authorities, this is particularly after the Federal Reserve was established, uh, followed a policy of tending a sort of a stop-go policy. They were late in reacting to changes in the right. economy, and when they acted, they acted too strongly. And even the Fed has learned from experience. And I believe that the performance of the Fed under Mr. Greenspan has been a better than under, under any prior chairman. So the Fed. You may know personally. I'm in favor of abolishing the Fed. Yes, I know. I know. I, I would rather get substitute. To that. A, I would rather substitute a computer for it. The business cycle is one of those phrases that is almost incantatory. People say it over and over again, and so I assume there must be a business cycle. Now I hear you saying you're not sure that such a thing even exists. If you want to see a real cycle, think of a seasonal cycle. Right. You can, that's an event. It's warm in the summer, it's cold in the winter, you grow food in the summer, you don't grow it in the winter. Predictable, So you have a real cycle, predictable. That would be a real honest-to-God cycle. All right. Now, the image of the business cycle that people have had is that there are, there are reactions in the economy of a similar kind which tend to run with reasonably regular frequency. Now, for one time, to give an example, mm -hmm. uh, one favor, favorite theory at a time was the so-called sunspot theory. If this, there are s spots on the sun which have a physical cycle, yes. a 10 year cycle roughly. And uh, that, does that does affect the fertility of crops in the, in, on the earth. It affects the growing conditions. And uh, Stanley Jevons, in the uh, econ English economist in the 19th century, uh, correlated the movements in agricultural output with the movements in the sun and argued that that was a cause of a business cycle. That would be a real honest-to-God cycle. Right. Uh, and people have been searching for some other mechanism. But what I think is really going on is a very different thing. I think that you have a reaction mechanism in the economy. The image I've always had is think of a, of a piece of wood up here with an elastic band glued on the bottom of it. All right. And every now and then, something comes along that plucks it down. Right. For example, you get the shock of the oil uh, embargoes. 
And that and knocks you're talking it, about the 70s. In the 70s. Right. That knocks it down. And that creates a recession. And then there is a reaction mechanism within the economy, which you can understand, that it takes time for what happens then to have its full effect. Uh, uh, some things react immediately, some things react later. And that reaction mechanism means that it will take a reasonably predictable amount of time for the economy to react back to there right. and get back up to that board up there, which defines its long-term uh, pa path. Right. And similarly, there might be something that pulls it up. Uh, all of a sudden, you get a war in which, in order to finance it, they print a lot of money. That mm -hmm. causes inflation. That produces a temporary boom. And then you react down to it. So the image I have is of, a, of an economy which is subject to shocks from time to time and which reacts to those shocks in a rather predictable manner with a predictable reaction mechanism in it. Now, we've been very fortunate since the, you see, the 70s, you had a serious recession. Right. As a result, as I believe, of the shock of the oil embargo. Now, right now, we've been very fortunate that we haven't had any, the, the one major shock we had in the period since then was the Asian crisis. Yes. It was the collapse of the Asian countries. But that Asian crisis was both favorable and unfavorable for us. It was unfavorable in the sense of, uh, of the financial disturbances it developed, but it was favorable in that it meant lower commodity prices. And suddenly Korean cars beca became less expensive. Favorable to manufacturers. Right. And also, because it caused people all over the world to be concerned about the safety of their assets, it was favorable to our financial markets. It, uh, it produced an inflow of foreign funds. Uh, to, to the safety safe of the American keeping. markets. Right, right. I see. So uh, because it had these opposite effects, it did not produce a serious recession in the United States. So that was a closest. Are the high growth rates of the past few years sustainable? It used to be a rule of thumb that the economy would grow at about 2.5, 3%. 3% a year was a good year. Now listen to these growth rates. 1996, 3.7%. 97, 4.5%. 98, 4.3%. 99, 4.1%. A question about the so-called new economy. Have we achieved a new permanently higher growth rate? Five years is not a very long basis. <laughs> you are not impressed. For a permanently higher. You undoubtedly have had rapid rates of growth. And I think there's no doubt that they derive from these technological developments and in computers and mm -hmm. in the information industry. And, but uh, that's a process of getting up to a new higher level. And once you get there, you won't grow any faster than you ever did before. It's not a, see, there's a big difference between a permanently higher growth rate mm -hmm. like this. Right, you're changing the whole, the slope and of the line. changing where that board is. Right. See, the board was there. And now you've had developments which enable you from the same resources to get a larger output. Right. So you're having the board shift from here, it's up here. Right. And in the process of the shift, you'll have a rapid growth for a few years until you get there. And then the growth rate will slow down. So you'd even expect though you to stay up there. You'd expect it to settle back down to 2.5%, 3% in that range. Well, all we know is that for the last 100, 150 years, it's been of the order of 2, 2.5%. Two all right. Now let me ask you this. Why? That sounds like a rule of the universe. If 100, 100 to 150 <laughs> no, years, isn't. all kinds of different economic regimes, yeah. the agrarian regime, and we, then we go through the Industrial Revolution, and now you're suggesting into this new information economy, and it's still 2.5% a year. I don't How know come? that it's 2.5% a year, but that average is an right. average of a lot of different numbers. All right. And these 4.5% numbers go into it. The zero numbers for a while go into it. Right. So uh, there's variability it, it's around just, that. It's just a pure statistical artifact, a statistical fact that on the average, it's been around two, two and a half percent. And, and so, unless you tell me something that will make it very different, right. see, don't misunderstand me. The benefits from the technological change are permanent. You have the whole level of the economy is higher than it otherwise would be. Right. And that's going to stay there. Right. Uh, I don't mean there won't be some dips and so on, but it'll stay there. But the effect on the rate of growth is temporary. Now, uh, related to this question of whether we've achieved a higher rate of productivity is have we achieved a new lower rate of unemployment? Uh, what the average level of unemployment is that you can maintain, what I defined as a natural rate of unemployment, depends on the circumstances of the, of the 
period. If you have a world in which you have very strong trade unions, lots of wage rigidities and fixed rates, you have high rates of unemployment, as in Germany or in Europe in general today, where rates of unemployment are, ten, they've just come down mm -hmm. to 10% in Germany. Right. And that's a result of having a very rigid wage system where wage, it's very hard to fire anybody, so people don't want to hire anybody. Right. And in which wages are fixed by union agreements and so on. On the other hand, if you have a more flexible economy, with, and unions have become much less important in the United States, right. then the natural rate of unemployment is on the average going to be lower. We have a much more fluid wage and labor market. We do. And what's more, uh, you have all sorts of developments in the way of part-time employment, uh, temporary employment agencies, uh, and information mm -hmm. is more readily available. It's easier to find out what jobs there are, where and they here, are. Here the internet is directly uh, absolutely. Uh, at play. I think the internet is, as I say, the internet has been a major factor. I think it will have tremendous effect. But, but on the level of where we'll be, not on the permanent rate of growth. Right. Okay, now we come to this. The information economy has driven the stock market to one new high after another. Has the bull market gone too far? Now, this is Milton Friedman in 1998. Quote, I have believed for some time now that the stock market was in a bubble. When you uttered those words, the Dow was at about 6,500. Yeah, I was wrong. Now, I was wrong at that time. But if you wait in it long enough, you'll be right. Right, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, do, so what do you believe about the markets today, the equity markets today in the United States? I think that they are in a... Uh, now, you uh, resist using the term bubble. I mean, why is that? You don't like that term? Well, because it's very hard to... You know, you only recognize a bubble after the event, not before. <sighs> All right. And we'll find out later whether it's a bubble. What do people mean when they say bubble? What, what they mean by a bubble, they mean that the levels of the stock market prices cannot be justified by the likely real earnings of the companies whose stocks are being valued. The rise in the market averages has been produced by a very small number of companies. The telecoms and the internet stocks. Right, right. It's a two-tier market, and the high-tech uh, market is in a bubble. You won't call it the new economy market and the old economy? If you want to call it the new economy market, I don't mind. All right. The newer economy market. But All right. Uh, the mar we, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about, the, as you say, the high tech. The and the telecoms. Telecoms. Okay. Now, 1920, uh, excuse me, 1929, the bubble burst. Equity markets in this country collapsed 80%. No. Hold on. Go slowly. All right. In 1929, when it burst, they did not collapse 80 percent. It was 80 percent over the course of the next three years. Over the in fact, by early 1930, the market was almost back. It had almost recovered from the collapse in wow. October. So let me rephrase it then: from peak to trough, recognizing that some years elapsed, but from peak to trough, it fell. The equity market fell 80 percent. The this reason I think I emphasize this right. is because I believe if the Federal Reserve had followed correct policy, right, the market, the the bottom of the market would have come in 30 or 31 rather than in 33, and would have been nothing like 80% below okay, where you're, it was. You're anticipating my question. Now, for, so from 29 to 33, we drop 80%. In Japan, when the bubble bursts, they drop about half, the equity market drops about half. Right. Now, the bubble bursts sometime we'll here in the United States. The, we'll have to see what the Federal Reserve does afterwards. What should it do? What it should do? Note to Alan Greenspan. <laughs> well, Alan Greenspan doesn't need a note. He understands monetary affairs every bit as much as I do. But, and what Alan, I will tell you what he will do. All right, that's a good point. Not what he should do. All right. But what he will do no, to investors is exactly in what he did in 1988, 87, when you had the <coughs> stock market b b decline. Right. The big decline. Right, about 25% in a couple days, as that's I recall. Right. right. He poured in money. He had the Federal Reserve follow a very easy money policy. And that's what he will do again if the market tanks. Not indefinitely, but for a time, to give it some cushion. The Fed knows now, we know now, what to do in the case of a serious fall. Well, off. when I say we know what to do, I don't mean to suggest it's an easy and obvious thing. How much? How rapidly? When? Do you overdo it? Do you move the economy into... Do you... See, you have to be careful. You don't want to uh, re restart the bubble. Right, right. 
So this is not as this is not like having a, a computer all set up to do it. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is push the button. Yeah. This is complicated, mm -hmm. tricky business. My com my computer setup instead of the Fed would be for the long term purpose and would eliminate all of this fine tuning. Would have none of this. Right. Would simply have the quantity of money go up regularly, day by day, week by week. Even in the event of a market day. fall off. Even in the you event, you would make no adjustment. No adjustment, because adjustment. <laughs> There are times when the adjustment is desired and good, but if you look over the record of the Federal Reserve over its whole history, it's done harm more often than it's done good. There are only a few periods, 23 to 28 as it happens is one of them. Right. And the recent few years are, it's another. Right. But there, if you tally the number of years in which they behaved in a way that I would score as excellent, in a way I would score as terrible, the terrible years greatly outnumber the excellent year. Now, the price you pay for a big depression like 29 to 33 cannot immense. be redeemed by softening the effect of, a, uh, of the 87 stock market collapse. Oh, I see. Now, Final question. Are Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve doing the job they ought to do? Given that we are in a bubble, at least one tier of the equity market is in a bubble, in your judgment, Alan Greenspan is the man you'd like to have in charge of all the levers. Well, He's likely to do as good a I job as anybody. Think, let me make <clears throat> it clear. It's not Alan Greenspan's business. Mm -hmm. It's not the Federal Reserve bo uh, System's business to try to control the stock market prices. Their business. So, so he was engaging in a no-no when a couple of years ago he said that the Absolutely. equity markets showed, quote, irrational exuberance. He should not have said that. All right. Absolutely. That was a mistake. All right. The business of the Fed is to keep prices stable, general prices, not stock market prices, but the prices you pay for bread and for milk and for cars and for coats and for hats and shoes, the average of all prices, general price level. That's its business, and it's one and only business, and it has no business trying to affect the stock market. All right, now, if you... But, but right. in order to prevent inflation, in order to keep stable prices, given that it has the power and, and the duty, it will have to react to changes in the stock market. But All it right. shouldn't try to determine what the stock market is. The consensus among traders and investors and business journalists right now is that the Fed is raising interest rates and that Alan Greenspan, if, if, with, with a purpose in mind, and that Alan Greenspan is doing everything but wiggle his ears to signal to the markets that he is serious, that he believes the market, equity markets are overvalued and he wants to cool this thing off and bring it down. Do you believe that's a correct reading of his actions? No, I don't. You don't? I think that that's an understandable reading of his actions, but I don't think it's a correct because what he has been stressing is not the market. What he has been stressing is what he, he believes is in, uh, uh, that the demand for output is increasing faster than the sustainable rate at which it can be increased. Right. That's the point he's stressing. And part and of the demand is the capital gain, right? Part so. of the gain, demand is a rising out of the capital gain. So the equity markets play a role there. Play a role in adding to the demand for goods and services. And his concern is that unless, if that continues, it will produce higher prices over the whole range of goods and services. And there's some evidence that there is a little pickup of inflation. I think he, he is correct to be worried about that. I think that if you look at what's been happening to total monetary growth, it's been too high to be sustainable over a long period. And it's appropriate for him to try to bring it down. Let me ask you a last question then on this, on this new economy. Is it a characteristic of this new emerging economy that the Fed is losing a certain element of control. Here's what I mean, that interest rates grow up and what we've seen in the markets in the last couple of weeks is that the Dow goes down and the NASDAQ takes off because investors calculate that the older industries represented in the Dow will be affected by increases in interest rates, but the high-tech industries, which are not as reliant on bank money, won't be. So we shift capital from a place where the Fed does seem to have control to the NASDAQ, the new stocks, where it doesn't have control, and Alan Greenspan is a frustrated and a sad man. The, Fed, the Federal Reserve has never had control of the stock market, but it has as much control over the economy as a whole, over the monetary growth of the economy as a whole as it ever had. There's nothing in this new economy that in any way at all reduces the powers of the Fed.
Now, of course, mm -hmm. when I say that, it's, I think that the market enormously overestimate the powers of the Fed, that they attribute to Greenspan a capacity to fine-tune anything in the world that he does not have, and that that's a source of danger because what affects mm -hmm. price level is partly what people expect the price level to be. Right. Price expectations. And at the moment, there is so much confidence in, in Greenspan's handling of Leave the economy. Leave it to Alan. Leave it to right. Alan. That people are forming price expectations that it is very hard to see as realistic. Milton Friedman, thank you very much. What a relief. Milton Friedman believes the equity markets are overvalued, but that when the markets come to their senses, the Federal Reserve will behave better today than it did in 1929. In other words, the dot-com economy will not go the way of the Model T. I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.